Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to everyone here at Community Church of Boston and everyone watching online. Thank you so much. Um, we're at the Community Church of Boston. This has been a peace and justice congregation since 1920. Over the past 100 years, we've had many remarkable speakers speak here, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B. Du Bois, and many, many others. And our remarkable history, we're carrying that tradition forward tonight. I'm so excited because we have Max Blumenthal with us tonight. Earlier today, my family came and visited me, and I thought, wow, I'm so lucky to be able to spend time with my family. And then I realized, I, I, I remembered uh, the people in Gaza, the young children, who are crying because their parents were killed, and the parents and grandparents who are crying because their children were killed. So even though we're so excited to have Max here with us tonight, uh, it's, it's, it's sad. A few years ago, uh, when Israel was bombing Gaza, we did an event with Max, and it, it's, it, it's sad that the, the reason we're all here. And this is important for us as American people because the United States supplies Israel with money and weapons and political support. So as American citizens and residents, this is a very important issue for us. So I'll just say a little word about the format of tonight's event. Uh, Max Blumenthal is going to give his talk, and then we're going to have some announcements from our church members, and then we're going to get into a Q&A, and we're planned to go for about two hours. So uh, the last thing I'll say before introducing Max is a big, big thank you to Dean Stevens and to Charlie Welsh and to Jose and to all of the Community Church of Boston for putting this together. And thank you again to all of you for coming out tonight and giving us your time and your attention and for being so passionate about what you care for. Max Blumenthal came here from DC and he's here to deliver us a talk. And Max is a very prominent journalist. Many of you are familiar with him. He's also uh, somewhat controversial depending on who you ask. He is the, he's a writer, he's a journalist, he's the author of books. He wrote a book called The 51 Day War about the war in Gaza in 2014. He wrote another book called Goliath, Life and Loathing in Greater Israel. He's, uh, he produced a documentary called Killing Gaza. Uh, he's also the editor and founder of the Gray Zone News. So if you want to check out Max Blumenthal, check out his books, check out his documentary Killing Gaza, and check out the Gray Zone News. Max, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dean, for the coffee. <laughs> I'm going to hold this, actually, and uh, you guys have... Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming out on this uh, unseasonably warm night in Boston. You can't hear me? Now you can hear me? Is this better? All right. Should I beatbox? <clears throat> well, it's good to see so many young people out here tonight, too. Just kidding. As I always say, never trust anyone under 30. Uh, this is our anti-war movement, uh, but I'm sure there are lots of people watching online. So hello to everyone watching the live stream. Uh, hello to everyone on Zoom. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this 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 means a lot to me to to be here. I wanted to be here in person uh, because this is actually my first talk on Gaza, I think, since 2015, which I guess 
you know, was about something similar that was happening. That was about my book, The 51 Day War, which is about Operation Protective Edge. Um, right now, as we speak, or a few hours ago, um, Israelis in Janine broadcast the Shema, which is the Jewish version of the Lord's Prayer. This is just our, our prayer that we say daily. They're broadcasting it from the loudspeakers of a mosque that they have seized in Janine, which they vandalized with the symbols of my faith community. They have erected a massive menorah over the destroyed neighborhood of Shujaia, east of Gaza City. Uh, they have lit flares for each candle of the menorah that's to be lit in the sky over the city of Khan Yunus, which is under assault by their air force. This is how they are observing the holiday that I observe, that many of you who are Jewish observe in a very different way. Uh, and it reminds me that the last talk I did on Gaza was at the synagogue on Passover of Rabbi Brant Rosen in Evanston, Illinois, outside Chicago, which is an anti-Zionist synagogue that was filled with Jews like me who see Zionism as transforming our religion into a fascist Nazi-like death cult, which is why we feel so passionately, one reason why we feel so passionately about this issue and why you see more and more rising to the occasion, coming to the fore, occupying the US Capitol, occupying streets around America to protest this genocide. Um, it's all bringing so many, it brings me so many memories back for me to, to be here. I just was in the back there looking at the, um, you know, a table of, uh, of Palestinian crafts and books, and I saw a book by a young artist named Malak Matar, who I realized, I realized this is the artist that we interviewed, uh, Dan Cohen and I, for a documentary, Killing Gaza, towards the end, uh, who managed to get out of Gaza and was able to produce that and show the world all the culture and sophistication that Gaza has to offer. So many others weren't able to get out. And you know, when I think back about all of the things I witnessed in Gaza in 2014, being in the rubble with families who saw their home that they had worked for for their entire lives with multiple levels for each generation destroyed, reduced to rubble, targeted with missiles, or speaking to people who had their entire families killed and nearly wiped from the civil registry of Gaza, speaking to families who witnessed their loved ones be killed on camera, like the family of Salem Shamali, who was killed by a, a sniper. Being in that environment, actually being under the bombing myself and feeling what that's like to have naval shells explode nearby, to have a drone over your head at night, to hear the missile strikes, to actually experience the terror that people experience day in and day out and have the option of leaving when they don't. Um, that to me made me so upset when I hear, when I see all of these morally fraudulent media personalities try to ambush those of us who stand in solidarity with Palestine about October 7th and try to demand that we condemn October 7th or we condemn Hamas when none of them condemned a single thing that happened before October 7th. If anything, they supported it. Massacre after massacre. S over 70 years of an unbearable cavalry experience by Palestinians and they have never been asked to condemn it. They've never asked a US official or a Western official or anyone who presided over this catastrophe to condemn it and we have to condemn something now? It's as if history didn't exist before October 7th. They hate context. They call it whataboutism. That's like code for context. So let's talk about some history first. Let's try to understand why this is happening um, and help everyone who's watching this understand a little bit better. Because between the time that I was first in Gaza and now there were at least two major military escalations which left hundreds of civilians dead, as well as the Great March of Return when civilians in Gaza did what Thomas Friedman asked them to do. 
He said, if they would just have a peace march and march towards Israel, young Israelis of Believe in Peace would join them and they would all march together to Jerusalem and it would change the Isra Jewish Israeli society's attitudes. Well, they went and did that. And what did is Israel do? They sent their young people in uniform to the frontiers of Gaza and they shot them all in the legs and they shot them in the heart. Yasser Murtaja, the journalist wearing a press vest, was shot in the neck. They killed, they maimed, and they showed what they thought of Gaza attempting unarmed resistance. And they left them with one other option. Before Protective Edge, before 2014, there were three major assaults on the Gaza Strip starting in 2006. It's actually four. Did I say three or four? There were actually four. The biggest one was Operation Cast Lead, 2008, 2009. Israel waited till Barack Obama was elected, knowing he would do nothing, say nothing, and they broke a ceasefire by massacring over 50 police cadets who had just graduated to be police officers in the Gaza Strip, an act of mass cop killing by the Israeli military, and they proceeded to massacre hundreds more civilians. This was a signal event for me that really spurred my commitment to this issue. Then 2011, 2012, Operation Pillar of Clouds, more massacres more by airstrikes. As Gaza's armed factions began to demonstrate their ability to develop some capacity to resist, some capacity to hit back. These confrontations were all the product of the siege of Gaza, which was itself the result of Israel's so-called disengagement when it pulled 9,000 fanatical settlers out of the Gaza Strip in 2005 um, with the intention of sealing Gaza off in order to give its military more latitude to operate against Hamas. And how did this disengagement, what triggered this disengagement? It was the armed, the armed actions of Hamas during the Second Intifada, which made the Israeli position in Gaza untenable. It was not any, negotiated, uh, any negotiation through the peace process that led to Gaza gaining some means of sovereignty. So what Israel decided to do was the panopticon model with Gaza. Control, all you need to do to control an entire prison is to control the perimeter, which is 2%. And so they would occupy Gaza from the outside, control the airspace, control all of its borders, the sea. Um, and this is also what they were beginning to do in the West Bank with the construction of the apartheid wall, which is not constructed between Israel and the West Bank. There is no Israel per se under international law because it refuses to de de declare any boundaries. So in many cases, the wall wraps around villages like Awalaje, completely surrounded by the wall, and cities like Kalkilia, completely surrounded by the wall, um, which is why Kalkilia is famous for its, its, its parkour crews who do lots of tricks off the wall. There's so many walls there. The population, though, isn't, isn't happy. They don't like doing parkour. That's just what they're left with. They're pissed off. That's why they voted for Hamas in the 2006 legislative elections in the West Bank town of Kalkilia. Hamas won in the West Bank, not Gaza, but then the, all of their legislators who won through democratic means were kidnapped. Israel attempted a coup working through the Bush administration in Gaza. They failed and were defeated there. Hamas took over. And behind all of this was the Oslo Accords and the peace process, which set the stage for the separation of the West Bank and the Gaza with walls from Israel and discredited the PA in the eyes of the Palestinian population as an occupation subcontractor leading to more support for Hamas. The support for Hamas didn't necessarily come from Islamism, Isla Islamist ideology, although that's a clear part of it. Their social services are a part of it. It came from outrage and, hum and anger at the occupation and the hardening of the occupation through the construction of these walls and the onset of a full-scale siege of the Gaza Strip. That's why they're there. And so Israel developed its own policy of occupation management, which was a doctrine also applied in southern Lebanon and Beirut during the 2006 Second Lebanon War, which it calls the Dahia Doctrine, to attack the towns and population centers from which attacks 
and resistance emerges. In other words, to attack these civilians and to humiliate, to, to demoralize them to the point where they will turn on their leadership somehow. And it's failed every time. This uh, doctrine was expressed by Gadi Eisenkot, who was the Army Chief of Staff at the time in 2006. He said, this is not uh, a proposal. This is an active plan for attacking civilians. Um, he just lost his son and nephew in the Gaza Strip. At the time, Israel had a demographer named Arnon Sofer, who was a academic who would consult for the government on how it could use this doctrine of disproportionate force to ensure a Jewish demographic majority indefinitely because that is the essence of Zionism, maintaining a Jewish demographic majority through violent engineering. And he said that because of the siege of Gaza, Arnon Sofar said this, the pressure at the border will become enormous and we will have to kill and kill and kill all day, every day in order to survive. And so that was really the essence of their plan. As Dove Weissglass, a consultant and legal advisor to the government of Ehud Olmert, who um, oversaw Operation Cast Lead, um, pr presented through a committee complex mathematical formulas used to determine the amount of calories each resident of Gaza would be entitled to on a weekly basis. This was another aspect of the siege to put them on a diet so that they won't starve. So this is the backdrop for October 6th. I'm not talking about October 7th yet. We're talking about October 6th. On October 6th, 2023, the Gaza Strip was under siege under these very conditions that I described, and they had been under siege for 15 years, and an entire pop a generation or two generations had grown up without ever leaving that small strip of land. They had grown up under uh, five military escalations, five military assaults. Just imagine what that, they'd grown up knowing the loss of family members to missile strikes, having go knowing the loss of their schoolmates with a totally different mentality than previous generations that had also suffered under apartheid. Gaza was under siege on October 6th. Gaza was also ignored. Do you all remember thinking about Gaza on October 6th? Because I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking about the Ukraine proxy war. I was thinking about U.S. troops occupying the Konoko oil fields in northeast Syria. I was thinking about the U.S. starvation siege of Cuba. I had almost forgotten about Gaza. I was thinking about um, doing, s you know, trying to do more stand-up shows with Jimmy Dore. Uh, it was a good break from all this destruction. So I was surprised by October 7th. You know who else was surprised? The National Security Council director for Joe Biden, Jake Sullivan, who declared at the Aspen Security Conference that the Middle East, and he was boasting, the Middle East had never been quieter than under the Biden administration. Everything was fine, and Iran was being put in its place, and there was no armed resistance coming from Gaza. Everything was fine because the Abraham Accords that Jared Kushner and his crew in implemented were going forward. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates were going to normalize and make peace with Israel. It was going to be great. A peace between the rich that would put the Palestinians in the icebox of history, that would consign Palestinians to the dustbin forever. On October 6th, Gaza was desperate. Gaza was ignored. Gaza was isolated. It had no diplomatic channels, even though it had a de facto government. And actually, in July of this year, there had been protests up and down the Gaza Strip over the dire economic conditions, people demanding some kind of dignity from a government that had no capacity to give it to them because that government was operating under siege. So the volcano was going to explode one way or another. And you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Palestinian hostages in Israeli prisons, including people who are connected to families in Gaza, including children. I've been to the children's court in Ofra military prison. You see them come in in chains. They're not charged with anything. Many of them had just thrown stones. Many of them had just pick picked up in their beds. You know, teenage boys. They were in prison, female prisoners. 
people in administrative detention, hundreds of them who hadn't been charged. And this is a major issue in the Gaza Strip. This is a major issue for the Prime Minister of the Gaza Strip, whose name is Yahya Senwar, who was himself a prisoner for much of his life. Uh, he had been in prison for killing Palestinian collaborators who had gotten Palestinians killed in the Gaza Strip working with Israeli intelligence. He was a young militant, and in prison he learned Hebrew. Uh, he followed studiously the culture and news and politics of Israel, got to know his jailers very well, and his brother was involved in the taking of Gilad Shalit, the Israeli soldier who is a tank gunner enforcing the siege of Gaza in 2006. His brother was involved in taking Shalit back to Gaza, which elevated Yahya Senwar in the eyes of Israeli intelligence, and he began negotiating directly with Israeli intelligence for the release of Shalit from within prison. And in 2011, he negotiated his own release along with 1,026 other Palestinian captives of Israel, Palestinian political prisoners, for one Israeli soldier. So this became the strategic rationale for October 7th, to put Palestine back at the center of history, to remove it from the ice box of normalization, to release Palestinian political prisoners who Sinwar is committed to, which is, is such a deep emotional issue in Palestinian society, and to start ending the siege, this, this interminable siege for which there was no negotiating channel, to establish some channel for negotiating an end to the siege. So October 7th was inevitable. And October 7th, well, began with attacks directed by Hamas's Nukba unit, which is an elite commando unit, to the extent that they have an elite commando unit in an army with homemade weapons, on Israeli military bases, not just in Reim and Nahal Az, which are connected to Kibbutzim and Israel's southern so-called Gaza envelope, they also managed to get 10 uh, commandos or militants into a base of Israel's elite a Unit 8200, its cyber warfare division, and nearly got out with a very sensitive intelligence, computers. Uh, they penetrated far more deeply into Israel's security apparatus than most people even realize. They killed many soldiers, at least 400, three, let's say at least 350 soldiers who were active duty enforcing the siege of Gaza were killed in a matter of hours. They were exposed as a kind of uh, paper tiger, a, what you see now, a TikTok army of Cowardly button pushers who hide within bases, inside tanks, who operate behind screens, who are not used to close quarters combat, and who are more accustomed to humiliating and beating farmers and small children in the West Bank, or defending settlers as they were at the time on October 7th. A large part of the Israeli reserve force was up in the northern West Bank near Huara defending fanatical settlers. And the, much of the Israel's Gaza division was wiped out by a modestly armed, modestly equipped, moderately trained guerrilla army that mostly entered Israeli territory through a multi-billion dollar fence on cheap Chinese motorbikes. So this was not just a shattering of Israel's psychological security blanket. It was a political scandal of unprecedented proportions for Israel. Israel's military intelligence apparatus, which is vaunted, which has this aura within you know, military and intelligence circles in the United States was exposed, and its spy tech was also exposed. The spy tech that it markets around the world, that's such a big part of Israel's economy, was revealed as basically worthless. Hamas's counterintelligence outmaneuvered Israel's intelligence. Palestine was placed back at the center of history and normalization. If you watched uh, anything that happened at the Doha Forum in Qatar, this past week, normalization between the Gulf monarchies and Israel was taken off the table. Diplomatic channels to Gaza were opened, especially over the issue of prisoners, and we have seen many prisoners come out in exchange for the some 200 Israeli hostages 
including some active duty soldiers which were taken on October 7th. And possibly most significantly, and this is a fact that I think isn't well recognized, uh, even by many people who follow this closely, Israel's borders were at least temporarily changed on October 7th for the first time since 1973. There's no one in the south. Southern Israel is now a closed military zone, and you need special permission to go there. You basically need to be in a tank or a part of the military. The people who lived in those kibbutzim who were brought there as a human wall in the early 1950s to ensure the containment of the population of refugees who'd been thrown off their land during the Nakba, they're, they're not there and they may not come back. The population of northern Israel near southern Lebanon where Hezbollah operates, which is waging some very intense skirmishes with the Israeli military right now, they are not there. It's totally depopulated. And is the Israeli military leadership believes that they will not be able to restore their de facto borders until they totally destroy any iteration of resistance from the Gaza Strip and southern Lebanon, which is one reason why their war has become so genocidal. Here's another reason, and it's psychological. Israel needed to introduce its own narrative of October 7th in order to mobilize its population and to propagandize our population into supporting what they were about to do, which was genocide. So they introduced these kinds of slogans, the worst killing of Jews since the Holocaust, to uh, remove the political context for the, that I just outlined of the October 7th attacks. The worst killing of, as if they were just killed just because they were Jews. Beheaded babies, Hamas is ISIS, a woman whose fetus was cut from her womb, an entire family tied together and mutilated and then burned alive while the Hamas militants ate lunch in the next room. This wasn't a story that was actually repeated on October 31st in Senate testimony by none other than Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And Joe Biden uh, has, in, in, you know, in re uh, his recent Hanukkah, uh, ceremony at the White House, or what I call the Dementiasburg Address, <laughs> repeated the lie of beheaded babies again for the third time after the White House actually retracted it on his behalf and warned him not to do it. He just can't stop doing it. It's like how he can't stop getting his son on different boards of directors. It shows the impact and the effectiveness of Israel's propaganda campaign after October 7th. And as we've been uh, uh, explaining at the Gray Zone and a few other independent outlets have been doing, it's all false. Not all false, okay? Let me be clear. I hate saying that term after Obama, sorry. <laughs> Let me be clear. I'm going to be extremely convoluted now. I won a Nobel Prize for peace and then I made war. No, um, well, I, 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 I do need to say that Hamas did, I, it's clear they did kill civilians on October 7th. There's not any denying that. Uh, but what they, the, the, re, the difference between the reality of what they did and the propaganda that Israel is putting forward is extremely significant. And the Israeli propaganda officials and their different cutouts in the U.S., made a determination that they could not just act on the reality alone and that they needed to concoct dramatic stories in order to win international support and maintain the consensus in Israel. And they turned to a very shady organization called Zaka, which was in these southern kibbutz uh, communities on October 11th, four days after the military had cleared the communities, and they began speaking to international media. They're kind of like a rescue organization, but they don't have coronary credentials. They're not an actually rescuers. Um, they're not real paramedics. What they are are orthodox Jewish, quote unquote, volunteers who often show up in the streets of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem on motorbikes, uh, wearing their little safety vests when there's an accident, and they make sure that the victims get a proper Jewish burial and that their body parts are disposed of properly. So they were sent in droves to these communities where people had been killed to collect the body parts, 
And then they went straight to international media with elaborate stories, mostly cooked up by one man, Yossi Landau, who's their so-called southern commander, who quote-unquote confirmed the beheaded baby story, spread the mutilated family lie, cooked up the fetus ripped cut from a mother, and none of it could be confirmed. And he constantly talked about babies being killed, babies being killed. Here's how you know that's a lie, just quickly. Only one baby was killed on October 7th. Her name was Myla Cohen. It's extremely tragic and messed up. Ten months old, she was shot accidentally by a Hamas militant who was firing on captives who were fleeing. That's apparently what took place. But there was only one baby killed, but they keep saying babies and babies and babies. So we know that's a lie. We know that's a lie. Zaka is also at the center of the rape allegations that are now being pushed as a um, uh, major international propaganda campaign by um, the Israeli government. I'll talk about those in a second, which is extremely ironic because Zaka's founder and longtime CEO, uh, Yehuda Meshi Zahav, died last year after attempting suicide in 2021 when he received the Israel Prize from the current defense minister, Yoav Gallant, and then days later, Israeli media was flooded with credible stories of his serial rape of teenagers and children of both sexes, along with long-standing stories of Zaka's corruption. Because for Zaka, for Zaka, this is a fundraising opportunity. And they are raking in tens of millions of dollars from the Jewish diaspora, from wealthy Jews in the U.S. by spinning out these elaborate stories and putting themselves at the center of this drama, of this genocidal passion play. And so is their chief competitor, United Hatzalah, another Orthodox Jewish so-called rescue organization, which is seeking to f is now fundraising on its website for fifty million dollars off October seventh. United Hatzalah's director Eli Beer appeared at a fundraiser in Las Vegas. I mean, how, 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 more, uh, how much more obvious can you get? You show up in Las Vegas at Sheldon Adelson's casino at the Republican Jewish Coalition's annual fundraiser. It's like every NFL owner is there. <laughs> and because, you know, we're so oppressed here in the U.S. Um, and he says that he... His organization found a baby, a Jewish baby that had been baked in an oven by Hamas, uh, conjuring up memories of the Holocaust deliberately. There was, of course, no evidence of this. It was a complete lie designed to gin up, uh, you know, scandal and drama and to outcompete Zaka and get money. They were at a literal fundraising event in Las Vegas. And that all folded into the, now the, the Hamas rape uh, propaganda, which is being spread by liberal, mostly within liberal democratic circles, because Joe Biden was losing liberal support on this issue, particularly among people under 35. So this, this narrative of Hamas rape was introduced in a coherent way over a month and a half after it all supposedly took place. To, uh, to, to support Israel's political objectives, which was to prevent Biden from losing his base. That's why at the U United Nations, the people you saw on stage there when Israel made its grand presentation were Hillary Clinton and neoliberal oligarch Sheryl Sandberg, who's also connected to the Democratic Party, used to work under Mark Zuckerberg. And it's, I've looked into it very closely you know, it's something that could happen in a conflict, possibly, and yet we received no direct testimony, not one. The New York Times, when it reported on it, stated that Israel has been reluctant to provide direct testimony. Same with uh, Haaretz had a piece. Testimony after testimony demonstrates uh, um, clear evidence of mass Hamas rape on October 7th. And then it, you read into the piece and they say there's no direct testimony. The piece in Haaretz was an interview with the Israeli army legal advisor, former legal advisor, uh, whose name is Kohav Eliakam Levi, who's the head of this civil commission on Hamas rape. 
Uh, and she's basically the one leading this propaganda campaign, getting the so-called pictures out and the testimonies out to different organizations and media. And one uh, of the most influential reports, if you can even call it that, that's been disseminated, that's had an influence on liberals and progressives is by uh, Physicians for Human Rights Israel. It's an Israeli group. And you know, you read this report, it also contains no direct testimony. It was completely engineered by Eliakam Levy. And their, one of their main exhibits is a photo that they refer to but don't show, which they say shows a woman stripped, to, stripped from the waist down uh, with her underwear up, dead, on the field at the Nova Electronic Music Festival where over 200, maybe some 250 civilians or non-combatants were killed in southern Israel on October 7th. And I found this photo's source uh, because it was being distributed first by the Israeli Foreign Ministry and on various websites they've set up. They're showing it in these secret screenings where they recently hosted Dr. Phil. Uh, they have all these celebrities come to these screenings, then they talk about, oh, the horror of Hamas. This photo is really central to their evidence, and I found it s sourced as early as March 2022, it appears to show dead Kurdistani female fighters who were killed by, I think, some of the um, Syrian Turkish backed forces that were also backed by the CIA. They're not Israeli. This is not October 7th. The picture's totally fake. It's not, it doesn't show what they claim that it does. And so when Kohav Eliakam Levy, from this October 7th Hamas Rape Commission spoke at Harvard, I clipped out the part where she refers to this photo and I tweeted that it refers to female Kurdistani fighters probably from 2022, definitely before 2023. And she responded to me. Wow, why would, why would, why would you even do that? Like, just ignore it because I nailed you. And she responded to me and says, thank you for all the publicity. Thank you for this. So uh, it I was so nervous at that talk. And you know, now I see that I'm having an impact, kind of like showing off to her base that someone, uh, you know, an anti-Semitic, uh, self-hating Jew was, w w was, was uh, criticizing her. And she said, I knew that I, I would be targeted, but I never thought that it would be like this. <laughs> at no point in her tweet did she deny that I was right that it was fake. She acknowledged that I was right. She acknowledged that it was fake it, tacitly, and then she blocked me. <laughs> so that's, that shows you the essence of this whole commission, what it's about, what their objectives are. Their objectives are just to get publicity, and they're not interested in the facts. They're interested in just shocking people into complying or stepping back while they commit genocide. Another key figure in this is someone named Yoni Sadon, a mysterious figure who's never been found but was quoted in the Times U uh, Sunday Times UK, their big feature on Hamas rape, who said that, he and he waited 50 days to say this, that he witnessed 10 Hamas militants simultaneously, and I'm sorry to anyone you know who's experienced sexual assault, but this is Israel cheapening sexual assault. This is what this is about, in order to massacre women and children. He witnessed 10 militants simultaneously gang raping a woman at the Electronic Music Festival in the chaos while Apache helicopters were operating overhead, while security there was shooting, exchanging fire with Hamas militants. They had time to stop and do that and he said that she had the face of an angel. Where, wh where is this coming from and who is Yoni Sadon? Many investigators from human rights groups have tried to track this figure down. And Yoni Sadon came out, the one Yoni Sadon on Twitter, and declared, I am not that guy. Can these um, feminist investigators stop writing me? Because I'm getting like 20 messages a day. No one can find him. The BBC interviewed as a key witness on this, someone named May Golan, who is Israel's Minister of Women's Empowerment. And she is a really powerful woman. We'll talk about her in a second. I, you know, Israel has like 60 cabinet members. They're all these like random cretins and fanatics and they give them all fake titles like Minister of Strategic Affairs and Tactical Consultation for Avigdor Lieberman, you know. And so she gets this title that makes her seem like she's some feminist role model to the British reporters who came to see her. 
I knew her because uh, there was this wave of race riots throughout Tel Aviv against African migrants, non-Jewish migrants, uh, from like 2012 through 2016, and she was leading those race riots. And my friend and colleague, the Israeli journalist David Sheen, had actually videotaped her leading one rally against, you know, chanting Sudanese out, where she declares that she's proud to be a racist. Well, they call us racist. I'm proud to be a racist. We need to be a racist in order to survive. And so this is now the Minister of Women's Empowerment who is providing evidence to the BBC for their documentary report. And she said that breasts were rolling on the ground and genitals were rolling on the ground on October 7th. Of course, she didn't witness this, and so they asked her for anyone who might have actually experienced these sorts of hideous attacks. And she said, well, they're all dead or they're in a mental institution, and we can't let you talk to the people in the mental institution. That's literally what she said. Okay, I could be proved wrong, and it would be you know, humiliating to me after coming out like this. S but it's been weeks and weeks since we've started criticizing this so-called inquiry, which was reported on the front page of the Washington Post. When we have the reality on the ground in Gaza of women being massacred, and yet no one's disproven anything I've said or anyone who's criticized it has said, and they can't provide, they can't bring us the direct testimonies yet. I mean, this is just what it is, all this atrocity propaganda from the Israelis. Think back to the first Gulf War in 1990. The Kuwaiti ambassador paid 16 public relations firms to get his nephew, Niara, trained to deliver testimony to U.S. Congress about witnessing Saddam Hussein's troops storm into a hospital in Kuwait City and remove children from their incubators and leave them there to die. And it all turned out to be fake, but this was the rationale stated sp explicitly by George H.W. Bush for going in and attacking Saddam Hussein's army and removing them from Kuwait and setting the stage for the next Gulf War, Iraq War II, which we saw created ISIS, left a million people dead. So it was fake. The Rantisi Pediatric Hospital, which came under attack by Israeli forces in, in the northern Gaza Strip, the only pedi which the, with the only pediatric oncology ward, was cleared of its doctors. The Israeli soldiers left five babies, ripped from their incubators in the hospital with no fuel, on their beds, to starve and die, and their rotting corpses were found there a week later. Babies were actually literally, clearly ripped from their incubators in the Gaza Strip. And it's like pulling teeth to try to even get US media to report on it. So we're, we're seeing these fake allegations used to justify that. That's what this is about. And it points to something even darker and more scandalous if you actually examine these allegations closely. You hear so much about burned bodies, people burned to a crisp, and you see the photos that they're distributing. Many of them are inside cars, and the cars are like melted. What did Hamas, what super weapon did these Hamas guys bring in on their cheap Chinese motorbikes that could do this on such a large scale? Why does it look so much like the highway of death where Iraqi soldiers were incinerated by U the U.S. Air Force as they left Kuwait. Compare those photos. And what about all the families they keep finding? And this, it's, it's, it's horrible to hear about this. It's actually, to, to do these investigations and, to, he and to, read the, to read the reality of it is horrible. It's very upsetting. But you keep hearing, reading about families in the kibbutzim found under the rubble of their homes, as families are now in Gaza, and the father on top of his children or wife trying to protect them under rubble. What happened there? Well, now the details are starting to emerge, and it points to something that is even more scandalous than October s the, uh, the official narrative of October 7th. And I wrote up several articles about this. And I'll give you some excerpts. Tuval Escapa, who is a member of the security team at Kibbutz Berry, where over 100 people died, set up a hotline to coordinate between Kibbutz residents and the Israeli army on October 7th. And he told the Israeli newspaper Haaretz 
that as desperation began to set in, quote, the commanders in the field made difficult decisions, including shelling houses on their occupants in order to eliminate the so-called terrorists along with their hostages. So they decided to shell Israeli homes knowing that Israelis were in them. A separate report published in Haaretz noted the Israeli military was, quote, compelled to request an aerial strike against its own military facility inside the Erez crossing, this giant hangar that you pass through to go in and out of Gaza, where the civilian coordination of the siege is located, in order to, quote, repulse the terrorists who had seized control. An Israeli woman who's one of the few survivors from Kibbutzberry who witnessed these hostage, hostage standoffs confirmed in an interview with Israel Radio that the military undoubtedly killed many Israeli non-combatants during gun battles with Hamas on October 7th. They eliminated everyone, she said, including the hostages. She and another woman who was the lone survivor of a hostage standoff in Kibbutzberry, as I reported, revealed that an Israeli tank killed 12 Israeli non-combatants, civilians, in one home, which was the site of a hostage standoff. Knowing that they were there, Yasmin Porat had actually gone across the street and told those special forces that there are 12 Israelis in there. They included her partner, as well as Lael Hetzroni, a 12-year-old girl, and her twin brother. Lael Hetzroni has become kind of an Israeli poster child for its October 7th propaganda. The former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, for example, has presented her as evidence of Hamas brutality. But now it is confirmed that the Israeli military killed her, along with her caretaker, her twin brother, and everyone else there. Take a look at, uh, take a look at the houses in Kibbutz Berry. What do they look like? They look a lot like the houses I saw on the Gaza Strip that had been destroyed by tank shells. They're completely roasted, reduced to their foundation. Uh, their roofs had been collapsed in, and entire families are being found and have been found in home after home after home. How could Hamas, with Kalashnikovs and at best RPGs and grenades, have exacted so much destruction, especially? under the pressure of being in firefights with Israeli special forces. This was what Colonel Nof Erez of the Israeli military called Mass Hannibal. He said, and I quote, they didn't explode houses with per without permission. The Hannibal Directive was apparently applied. And it was applied not just in the kibbutzim, it was applied against cars that were going in and out of Gaza, in and around the Nova Electronic Music Festival, a site of mass death on October 7th. This has been disclosed also by Israeli former abductees who, is, who were uh, freed from the Gaza Strip during a war cabinet meeting last week with Benjamin Netanyahu, who said, you shot at me with a helicopter on my way into the Gaza Strip, and then you bombed us and killed uh, other hostages in the Gaza Strip with your warplanes, and our biggest fear was that you would kill us and then blame Hamas. Those are almost direct quotes from the War Cabinet meeting, which have been publicized in Israeli media, but not by our own media. So I referred to the Hannibal Directive. Do you all know what the Hannibal Directive is? I see some thumbs up and some nodding. Well, I got to go to those who don't know. It was named for the Carthaginian general who took poison, killed himself rather than be captured by the enemy. So that should tell you something about what it is. It used to be a secret Israeli military directive that was put in place after the Jibril prisoner exchange. Um, I think that was in 1986 for Ahmed Jibril um, and uh, many other, something, something like 3,000 Palestinian militants were freed in exchange for a handful of Israeli soldiers. Very politically painful, uh, devastating for any Israeli leader who has to enact such a prisoner exchange. It was exposed in 2014 on Black Friday, August, August 1st, 2014, when an Israeli colonel named Hadar Golden was captured by Hamas militants in the southern city of Rafah. Um, it's called Black Friday because the Israeli military carried out a massacre in order to not just eliminate those militants and kill 100 people in Rafah. I was there immediately afterwards. I saw just um, shells of US-made weapons all over the ground, destroyed homes, but also to kill Hadar Golden, the Israeli soldier, because they didn't want to do another Gilad Shalit massive prisoner swap. So this was mass Hannibal. 
kill Israelis so they don't go into Gaza, so we don't have to do some gigantic prisoner exchange and then start negotiating for an end of the siege. And look at where they are now. It's de politically destabilizing for them to have over 200 captives inside the Gaza Strip. I was called a conspiracist and a master manipulator in two separate articles by Haaretz for quoting their own reporting and bringing these facts forward in the gray zone to English-speaking audiences alongside other independent outlets like Electronic Intifada and Mondo White. Today, Haaretz published an article declaring that the issue of the Hannibal Directive on October 7th is something, quote, we need to talk about. Thank you. I'll accept your apology another time. I just want to get the truth out. And I want Israelis to see how they're being, being manipulated. The atrocity propaganda is believed by nearly all Israelis. It's what's driving the consensus for this assault, Operation Iron Swords, whose objective is not the elimination of Hamas, which is actually impossible because they are politically and ideologically integrated into the population. They are the population. I don't mean they're human shields. They have a mass constituent base, like every anti-colonial resistance movement ever has. The goal is the elimination of Gaza as a Palestinian entity capable of resisting occupation. That's how this, so, so this atrocity propaganda fell on very fertile soil in a hyper-propagandized society which has full military conscription for all men and women at, of, of the age of 18 and above. And it has fueled a genocidal discourse in which the prime minister has referred to the Palestinians of Gaza as Amalek, who are the tribe that attacked the Hebrews as they fled Egypt in the book of Deuteronomy and were slain by God. God killed Amalek. He's referred to the Palestinians as the children of darkness and Jewish Israelis as the children of light. Likud, member of Knesset Ariel Kalner, has called for Nakba 2.0. There are no uninvolved civilians, said Amihai Eliyahu, who's the Israeli minister of housing who's proposed dropping a nuclear weapon on Gaza. Human animals is how Yoav Gallant, the Israeli defense minister, referred to the population of Gaza as he called for cutting off fuel, water, and electricity. And others have called for turning Gaza into a giant stadium parking lot. 1.8% of Israelis, according to a Tel Aviv University poll, believe Israel has used too much explosives on Gaza. And over 50% believe Israel has not used enough. Where it has dropped the equivalent of over two nuclear bombs, of the two nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima, where most civilians who have been killed have been killed by missiles, and not just any missiles, but unguided missiles, 500, 200-pound dumb bombs supplied by General Dynamics and Raytheon. Where most, and where new, um, and where um, AI weapons are being used to carry out a goal spelled out by Netanyahu's special advisor, Ron Dermer, former ambassador to the U.S., the thinning of the population of Gaza. This was the goal that explicitly was spelled out by, by Dermer, who's actually leading a task force to advance that goal. So now we know, unsurprisingly to those of us who followed this for years, that private family homes have been explicitly authorized as targets as hundreds of families are being wiped from the civil registry and the Israeli startup nation has introduced the world to a new innovation, wounded child without family. Wounded children turning up as the lone survivor of their entire family in Gaza hospitals is a new Israeli innovation. Nothing happens by accident, said a Israeli military intelligence official. When a three-year-old girl is killed in a home in Gaza, it's because someone in the army decided it wasn't a big deal for her to be killed, that it was a price worth paying in order to hit another target. We are not Hamas. These are not random rockets. Everything is intentional. We know exactly how much collateral damage there is in every home. This was one of the five intelligence sources who spoke to 972 magazine, which is a critical Israeli publication about how Israel is generating its targets in the Gaza Strip. It's generating them 
through a system called the gospel, which is an artificial intelligence system that according to this report and these sources generates targets in Gaza faster than they can be hit. In the majority of cases, another source from the Israeli intelligence apparatus added, military and activities not conducted from the homes that it targets. I remember thinking that it was like if Palestinian militants would bomb all the private residences of our families when Israeli soldiers go to sleep at home on the weekend, said the source. Um, so who's the human shield? They're targeting Gaza civilians in their homes while they sleep. They're targeting Gaza's hospitals. 100 Israeli physicians have signed a public letter, including pediatricians, authorizing and supporting the Israeli military's assault on hospitals in the Gaza Strip, particularly Shifa Hospital, the main center of medical care in the entire Gaza Strip, which I've visited several times, which has now been emptied. Yesterday, Kamal Hawash Hosp Hospital was emptied in the northern Gaza Strip. Everyone inside the hospital, everyone sheltering there was sent marching, in, including premature babies. They were just sent out, including people in the intensive care unit, including over 60 badly wounded people sent out into the streets where homes are destroyed with the support of Israeli doctors. Israel is killing the educated class one by one with targeted assassinations. The family of one of the most renowned journalists in the Gaza Strip, Wael Dadu of Al Jazeera, was assassinated at home. His son and daughter, who both hoped to be journalists, his wife, in a targeted assassination. And an Israeli journalist went on Israel's Channel 2 the following day and said, yeah, we didn't like his reporting. Rawan Ahmed Yassin is one of many medical professionals who was killed. She studied Studied medical analysis and what am I doing wrong? No, 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 continue. Okay, I seemed alarmed. Uh, and dreamed of completing a master's degree in genetics. I can't think of, I can't even say how many medical professionals have been killed, but this is just one. I was actually speaking to Dr. Mads Gilbert, my friend who performed emergency surgeries at Shifa Hospital in 2014 during Israel's assault, and he said um, that so many of the students he met and his coworkers have been killed. Social media influencers that we might have been followed have been killed in targeted strikes. Yafa Haider Abu Baraka is one. And then we have my friend Dr. Rifat al who many of you now know of or may have known of before, um, who is an exceptional individual who was killed in a targeted strike. And uh, at my last talk on Gaza back in 2015, at Brant Rosen Synagogue in Chicago, I spoke about Rifat. Uh, I ended my talk by speaking about him because he's someone who just made such a deep impression on me um, from Gaza. He is a poet. Many of you know his poetry now. It's excellent poetry. I mean, I'm a pretty harsh critic of other writers. It's, his poetry is impressive, and he's writing in English. He's not even writing in his native tongue. And it really captures the moment. Um, he was a teacher at Islamic University of English Literature. And his um, classes are exceptional. He's, he's one of the more popular academics in Gaza, just among students. And I didn't meet him in Gaza. I actually met him during what he called his Malcolm X moment. You know when Malcolm X went to Mecca? And he prayed alongside people with light skin, Caucasians. And he realized the essence of white people is not evil. And he began moving towards orthodox Islam and moving away from the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, which were based on racial essentialism and which he did not consider to be a true faith. It made Malcolm into an anti-imperialist. It made him into a force of resistance that was much more dangerous to U.S. empire than someone who just simply divided people along racial lines. It made him into an internationalist, and he began 
traveling the world visiting Ben Bella and Algeria and other anti-colonial figures. This is a very dangerous moment for the U.S. Empire, and I believe Rifat al arirs trip to his book tour for Gaza Writes Back, which was published by my friend Helena Cobbin, is a great collection of Palestinian writing. I believe that was a dangerous moment as well for U.S. Empire and for Israel's little extension of U.S. Empire because he had previously held anti-Semitic views in his own words, and why wouldn't he, honestly? Why wouldn't anyone in Gaza, if you've never left, and the only experience you have with Jews is people piloting drones over your house to kill your family, rampaging through your neighborhoods, humiliating your people, and they place the Star of David on their weapons. That's what they, and that's, and he said, this is how they want me to think, and I'm not going to think this way anymore, because he started to meet anti-Zionist Jews and to see the, the humanity of our community here in the United States. So I met him at dinner in Berkeley with other anti-Zionist Jews like Nora Barrows Friedman of Electronic Intifada, Ali Abu Nima was there. And we, you know, we had a great time and he went back to Gaza and began teaching his students The Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare's play about uh, a Jew named Shylock who was op in many ways oppressed He's considered sort of an anti-Semitic stereotype, but he was actually oppressed, ghettoized, isol uh, and um, humiliated. And when they, his students finished reading The Merchant of Venice, Rifat asked them which character did they identify with more, Othello, the Venetian general of Arab origin, or Shylock, the Jew? And he described their response as the most emotional moment of what was then his six-year teaching career. One by one, his students declared an almost visceral identification with Shylock. And in uh, one of his students' final papers, she, uh, the student reworked Shylock's famous you know, cri de coeur into an appeal to the conscience of her own oppressors in the United States and Israel. Hath not a Palestinian eyes, hath not a Palestinian hands, organs, dimensions, Senses, affections, passions, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian or Jew is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we laugh? Do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? Rifat taught Hebrew literature, not because he had any affinity for Israel, but because it also contained literary beauty. And so he was the first academic at Islamic University, which was founded by Hamas to teach Hebrew literature. He saw this all as a form of resistance. And he saw anti-Zionist Jews, who he would bring to his class if they were in the Gaza Strip, as comrades in resisting Zionism. And he expressed himself on Twitter in the same way we all do, as a funny troll. Because how can you survive psychologically under this propaganda assault if you're not hitting back at the lies and the insanity spiraling out of the Israeli propaganda channels? So when this fake story from a Las Vegas Adelson fundraiser spun out about a baby burned in an oven alive came out we all started kind of mocking it because it, it it offends our sensibilities it cheapens the holocaust just as they cheapen sexual assault and Rifat responded to a tweet by saying was the baby uh, you know baked with baking powder or oil it was something like that there was no baby baked in an oven so you're not mocking a baby burned in an oven okay that's not how Barry Weiss, the neoconservative, well-heeled pundit who now has just founded a uh, Likudnik diploma mill in Austin, that's not how she received it. She did a long thread on Twitter about how her former employer at the New York Times was anti-Semitic. And as Exhibit A, she pointed to Rifat's tweet, which she said was mocking a baby burned in an oven and not mocking propaganda. 
So then Rifat, who was in northern Gaza, who chose to stay in northern Gaza, defying Israeli orders to move south, and said, I will stay on my land even if it means being in harm's way, as if people in the south aren't in harm's way. He, his direct messages, his inbox began filling up with threats, not only by pro-Israel fanatics, but by active duty Israeli soldiers who pledged to kill them when they arrived to his area of northern Gaza. Not just threats, but d detailed threats to carry out sexual assault on his family members. Disgusting, vivid visions of torture. And it wasn't just Barry Weiss, a so-called comedian on one of the most popular programs in Israel called Eretz Nehederet, which is their version of Saturday Night Live. I would call it like Saturday Night Dead because they think genocide is funny. They began taking aim at Rifat. One poet, one author who threatened them so much with his words in the Gaza Strip was targeted on one of Israel's most popular programs and targeted by one of the most prominent neocon pundits in the US and Israeli military soldiers and reservists were vowing to kill him because they couldn't take a joke. Which is so un-Jewish to me. <laughs> I mean, Zionists have really done a great job of defying the stereotype of superior Jewish humor and intelligence, haven't they? <laughs> and so, no, December 6th, I sent Rifat a message. We had been having exchanges. And I said, I hope you're hanging in there because the tanks were closing in on his area of Shujaia. And I hadn't heard from him in three days. And I never heard back. He had been in a United Nations shelter, sheltering with his family. He received a phone call telling him they were going to kill him. And he said, if they're going to kill me here, they're going to kill all these people around me and all these other families. And so he retired to his sister's apartment with his nuclear family and was killed in a targeted strike along with his family. And he's, as we speak, or as we sit here, he and his family are still under the rubble, unreachable. He was killed for his words because his words were so threatening. Um, I have a lot more to say, but uh, I think we should go to Q&A um, just to, to use as much time for Q&A and maybe it can come out during Q&A. But I want to close, I guess, with Rifat's, some of his last words to the public. He, he uh, one of his final interviews, as the tanks and snipers were closing in, his voice was trembling. and You could hear the bombs thundering in the distance. He was speaking to Electronic Intifada, to those who we met when I first met him were there at the dinner table at this nice restaurant in Berkeley. Uh, and he was forced to envision his own death. And he vowed to resist to the end with the only instrument at his disposal. He said, I'm an academic. Probably the toughest thing I have at home is an Expo marker. But if the Israelis invade, if the paratroopers charge at us, going from door to door to massacre us, I'm going to use that marker to throw it at the Israeli soldiers, even if that's the last thing that I do. We're not soldiers, but we have an obligation to pick up where he left off with what we can. We have to pick up the marker. Pick up the marker and throw th your marker at the architects of this genocide for the rest of your lives. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. As Max said, we're going to get into Q&A shortly. But before that, uh, we, ha we have some church members that who are going to make a few announcements. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, if you want to uh, 
like get more of this information that Matt's presented to us, you can check out the Gray Zone News on their website or YouTube. So please do that. Uh, gray Zone. The, the Gray Zone. The Gray Zone. Okay. Gray, gray with an A. Um, and they're on every social media. I also want to give a shout out to uh, Sabby Sabs, who's in the house with us live. She's a world famous podcaster, so check her out too. Check out her podcast and all her social media. And I also want to say thank you to her producer, Eric, who helped us uh, put this event together. And I also want to thank everyone else. Who yes, let's clap for Eric. And I also just wanted to thank everyone else who uh, helped us put this event together. There's so many people, and um, it's too many to name, but I'll name some. Corey, thank you. And um, Cole, thank you for coming. And a uh, big thank you to everyone, again, at the community church. And on that note, I want to introduce our church administrator and music director and my friend, Dean Stevens. Dean, welcome. We almost always start with a bur uh, lighting of a candle, but I can't find one. But if we did, we would dedicate this night to Rifat al -Arir. And to all those tens of thousands who are lost in Gaza. There once was a land called Palestine where Christians, Muslims, and Jews lived fine in the 1800s. It was ruled by the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, a bearded guy founded Zionism for Jews to aspire, a land that becomes their home and safe only for their kind. Then there was World War I that ended when the Allies won and England was like, hey, this beautiful land is totally mine. Still, the name was Palestine, even though it was colonized, and a promise for a Zionist state was made by a man that had no right. Then more and more Jews arrive seeking refuge, and that's all right until their plan to steal the land they could no longer hide. The year was 1948 when Israel bullied its way into a state, and thousands of Palestinians fled their homes just to survive. No right to return, no right for a home, no right to fight for the land they owned. Israel expanded more and more into an apartheid. Where is your Humanity, where is your respect for dignity? Call it flat conflict, that's insanity. It's time to change your mind. One day Palestine will be free, so be on the right side of history. You're not anti Semitic if you stand against war crimes. Don't be brainwashed by the news now, you can see for yourself their truth. Learn about the story. Story of Palestine. <laughs> Written by a young artist who knows herself as a content creator named Iman Askar from Egypt. Uh, check her out, Iman Askar. We have a new newsletter that just came out, and thank you to Crystal Rollins Jackson for, for getting this out while I was away. And thank you to Amar uh, and for for Sunday's program, uh, which uh, which was an amazing author named Linda Dittmar, elderly academic who lives in Cambridge and who was born in historic Palestine, um, and has an amazing book that she signed for us and is in our library here. You can't have it because I'm reading it and can't put it down. Linda Dittmar. I also have copies of two of Max's books. Um, uh, Goliath and the, f the, the 41 Day War, and I'm going to get those signed and donate them, and they will be in our Palestine library over here. Um, so check that out as well. Um, we have um, with us one of our members, Susan Gazal, who um, would like to read our statement that we've worked on to, to say what we think about Palestine, Gaza, Israel. Susan Gazal.
the community church of Boston is heartbroken by the ongoing genocide in Gaza, being executed by Israel with the use of U.S. weapons and U.S. political and financial support. We recognize that this conflict is a manifestation of the occupation and apartheid against the Palestinian people. We call on our political leaders to use their leverage to enact an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, along with humanitarian relief for the Palestinian people of Gaza, living amongst carnage and in horrible. We call for a just resolution for the Palestinian people, without which there can be no peace in the Holy Land. The Community Church of Boston is a free community united for the study and practice of universal religion where all are welcome. The Community Church of Boston has been a peace and justice congregation since the 1920s that was founded in protest to World War I and in protest of the persecution and unjust execution of Saku and Vanzetti. We are committed to peace and justice for all, including Palestinians and Israelis. In this spirit, we will continue to support local and international rallies, direct actions, civil disobedience, and more. We will also continue hosting programs about Palestine and Israel in our efforts to educate ourselves and others. And the next one is going to be this Sunday, Sunday, December 17, in Boston. We're going to be at the Boston Common at 12 p.m. at the band stand. Boston Coalition for Palestine is calling all of us because we need to be out on the streets and our voice needs to be heard and united. I just came from the Hanukkah for ceasefire tonight and it was wonderful. And I'm very sorry that um, I just heard his poem after he was dead. And he's asking us to fly a white kite, and someone just donated 30 kites for this rally this Sunday. So if you want to bring your own kites or anything to show your support for all the artists and people in Gaza, please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, also, a bunch of things coming, uh, coming up. Um, Saturday, we have a uh, gala evening uh, dinner and holiday celebration at the end of the year, uh, hosted by Encuentro Cinco. Uh, join us uh, Saturday evening. If you are a member of Community Church uh, and remember Ron Elbert, there will be a, a memorial for Ron at 1 p.m., fellow worker and comrade Ron Elbert, Presente, we say, at 1 p.m. Saturday, and then the evening, the, uh, the gala event. Sunday, our, our own um, Taylor Swift, his name is Richard Wolf, and his, his views on our, our channel uh, have a million, his videos have, one of them has a million views. Um, and, and I want to mention that uh, Max ha has a thousand people watching on YouTube right now. Uh, over a thousand, uh, Amar informs us. So it's just like, I feel like this is a really major address event and just I'm really honored that Max has, has joined us today. Um, we, we were covering Max's travel expenses, but we want to send Max away with, with a really nice uh, honorarium as well. That uh, a basket in the back is for that very purpose, all, all proceeds to the speaker. So um, uh, keep that in mind as you, as you leave tonight. Um, we have a whole bunch of crafts from Palestine in the back of the room. Also around here are crafts from El Salvador and Guatemala. Uh, holiday is, is upon us, and uh, don't forget that as you walk around and look at uh, some of the things we have. Tons of books as well uh, willed to us by um, a deceased member, lots of books. So um, that's how we want to start the, the Q&A with Max. Great. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Susan. Now we're going to hear more anti-Semitism from Max in the Q&A portion. Uh, 
so uh, I have a wireless mic here, and uh, people can raise their hands, and I'll go around and pass the mic. But first, we're going to hear from Sabi Sabs. So, Sabi, welcome. You look surprised. Yeah. Um, I'll be quick. I do have legs. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to say I know a lot of you have probably heard the news that has happened at Harvard and MIT with the, the presidents of those universities. For those who are not aware, I, used, I worked at both of those colleges. Um, so a lot of the students and former students have reached out to me. They are, are very concerned um, about what is going to happen to them as well in reference to free speech. I just want to remind everyone, if you actually look at the First Amendment, it actually says that Congress is not allowed to make any law uh, that prohibits free speech. So just remind people of that when you hear this type of pressure that's coming from, I guess, like the propaganda machine in reference to silencing these presidents. I don't know what's going to happen to the president of Harvard and MIT, but there is a lot of tremendous pressure that was started from a particular billionaire uh, to push them out. So just in FYI, this just goes to show you again how big money really does have a handle on a lot of things, not just electoral politics, but also uh, the collegiate space as well. And then also I just want to end with, uh, this is the second uh, Israel-Gaza event I've been able to attend within two weeks. Miko Palid was at MIT last week, so I saw him too. So I think it's just great that more people are getting the message out. Thanks, Sabi. And now we can get into Q&A. OK, so uh, yeah, so first we'll go to Bob. Hold on, Bob. Hold on. Yeah, but don't, don't hold the mic forever, though. OK. Because it gives you a lot of power that only okay. I should have. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be brief, but can you just say something about the obvious what are the barriers to the Palestinians from l for leaving uh, Gaza? That would be, you know, the obvious thing to remove themselves from the conflict. So, what are the barriers? I mean, I, I can think of many, but if you could just say something about that. The barriers are Israel and Egypt, and Egypt is controlled by Israel and the U.S. So, the barriers are extreme. Uh, the last time I was in Gaza, in, in Gaza was early 2018, and I went to visit a friend and watch some uh, football, as we know it, soccer, and um, in between blackouts because there was a fuel shortage, and uh, you know his living room was filled with guys who wanted to get out and visit their families. One of them was had been there, he said, for I think two years, waiting for a permit to leave, and his entire family was in the United Arab Emirates. And he, the reason he was in Gaza was he just couldn't get a permit to leave through Rafah. It's, so, it's very hard to do. Um, and then, you know, the Israelis will try to make you leave for as long as possible so they can kind of thin the population. They like for you to go to university for a long time and not be able to come back and visit in between your studies um, and to become estranged from Gaza. Um, and now you have a situation where no one can get in or out because of the, the war. And it's impossible to get aid in. You know, Samantha Power, I mean, this is something I wanted to say. Samantha Power is the head of USAID. She is known for being sort of the avatar of the so-called genocide prevention industry. Uh, you know, they, she always invokes genocide when, you know, the US wants regime change in Syria or Russia or wherever. Everyone's committing genocide except Israel. And her first book was about how uh, you know, she, she lacerated all these Clinton administration officials, including Susan Rice, who's the domestic policy advisor or something for Biden, for, for a few, what's that? They now work together, yeah, but. Yeah, so she, well, she went after, she was a journalist going after all these Clinton officials because they didn't quit or raise hell during the Rwanda genocide. And now Samantha Power is party to a genocide and she's playing a particularly insidious role by going on Twitter and boasting about all the aid that's being shipped to Egypt to go into Gaza. But the aid isn't going in because Israel controls Egypt in the border. So I was in Egypt with a delegation and we wanted to get to the Rafah 
crossing to be able to show how the aid wasn't going in, to highlight the humanitarian situation. There are five checkpoints between Cairo and Rafa. We were not going to be allowed past the first checkpoint. Our permission never arrived. You don't even have permission to go out in public and read a statement in Cairo. It's, it's, nothing can happen there. But Israel controls the last checkpoint before you get to Rafa. Okay, so all of the, I mean, this is so important to understand because Israel's using hunger as a weapon now, along with disease. It is deliberately letting disease spread in the rainy season and in the cold to try to starve out the population. So they just simply give up. Uh, Karen Shalom is an Israeli crossing that is equipped to check trucks with x-rays, and that's where everything normally goes in. That's been closed, and they check the trucks at um, an Israeli checkpoint just on the Israeli side and then send them back into Egypt towards Arish, and then they go to Rafa. And Rafa is not equipped to bring in many trucks with x-rays, um, and so it's hard to get trucks in there, period. It's mainly for people to go in and out. And what I understand from a source very close to what's happening there is Israel's taking all the anesthetic out of these trucks. That's why you see so many children not getting, uh, you know, having amputations without anesthetic. None of the aid is going into northern Gaza because the Israeli military is there. They're not allowing any trucks in there. And only like 100 trucks every few days are going in, which is barely enough for like one town or one city in Gaza. Um, and then you have 2 million or 1.5 million people cramped in the south. Many of them don't even know where they are, like in Rafa. And uh, they're sleeping on the streets. They're sleeping in tents. There's intense rain. There's flooding in these encampments. Uh, it's a humanitarian catastrophe manufactured by Israel, which has deliberately taken out all the hospitals in the north and is attacking the hospitals in the south. And here's what Haaretz just reported. Um, because of the attacks on hospitals and the exposure of the population, the infection spreading in the Gaza Strip due to the quote-unquote difficult humanitarian situation are expected to harm the Palestinians and from there spread further across the border and begin to infect Israelis in the southern settlements as well as infected soldiers with super diseases. Here's testimony by someone who you should all follow on Twitter named Iman Basher, E-M-A-N-B-A-S-H-E-R. She's tweeting live, tweeting the genocide that she's experiencing in English. Hi, this is Iman. You might know me here as a Gazan mom of three. I have lost a house, friends, family, and students. I am now appealing to all the mothers in the world. Food is running out. We are sheltering in a United Nations Relief Works Agency school. I have two sick children with no near hospitals or decent medical treatment in the area. Today I've spent three hours looking for thick winter coats for the children, and I couldn't find any. The things adults are facing and living are beyond catastrophic. Imagine what children go through. If there's any power in you, anything you can do to talk or help in a permanent ceasefire, don't stop. I am this close to losing my children to starvation, dehydration, or sickness if an Israeli sniper doesn't kill them first. So that's the siege that they're facing, but it's been a siege for 15 years at a slightly different level. Great. Thank you, Max. Um, and thank you, Bob, for the question. So now we go to our next question, and here we go. So in the, I'll try not to turn my question into too much of a talk, but in the spirit of, of raising that marker and fighting back, I just want to quickly announce that there's an action Saturday morning, 10.30 in Brockton, um, right at Westgate Mall. If anyone can uh, send that out to their contacts, people who live down near the South Shore. Um, so... But my question has to do more with around what, what's happening here in the U.S. because this is funded by our tax dollars, by our ruling class. So we're trying to push back with it. In my union, we're trying to push back with it um, on it and have had some success, but the, then there's been attacks. We I actually got, we got doxxed, and our resolution was published in the Daily Wire along with my name and the name of another union member who's who was on that uh, that resolution and I so that's I'm just saying that because it's on my mind but it leads to the question of of what can you speak to that issue of here in the US how uh, you know the censorship the pressure coming from people not so it's you know they're not necessarily 
hardcore Zionists, but they're in fear, and they're using that 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 line that to talk about the genocide is is you know somehow anti-Semitic, which is how we've been attacked in our union, or is you know is divisive. If you just speak generally to that issue. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing new for those of us who's been involved. And thanks for what you're doing. We saw the United Auto Workers pass a resolution. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. But I'm, the United Auto Workers has created a lot of space for union activity on this by declaring their opposition and their call for a ceasefire uh, under uh, new leadership. And so I think uh, it's an important moment for unions. Unions, unfortunately, a lot of unions represent workers whose jobs are dependent on military industry, which is one of our few productive industries. You know, like the tear gas that Israel uses to repress Palestinians is made in Western Pennsylvania, uh, you know, John Fetterman territory. And uh, no, that's not what happened to him. Uh, many things happened to him. And, you know, he's sort of a perfect um, emblem or embodiment of the, our zombified political class, because he's basically a cyborg who's controlled by other people, um, and he was paid a lot of money, legal bribery, by the Israel lobby in Pennsylvania through a campaign led by the former chief of staff to Bob Casey, who's an Israeli cutout, basically. And they now have a billboard campaign all around Pennsylvania thanking John Fetterman for what he's done. They basically took a cyborg and just animated him into like a genocide lackey. And uh, but that's what they do with all, so many of the senators. And like, you know, in Texas, there's Elbit Systems has a huge factory. Elbit makes the Hermes drones that are killing everyone. So many people in Gaza. Those are jo they're job creators. That's how it's seen. And a lot of those jobs are union jobs. So it becomes difficult for unions to step up um, and by design. By design, I mean, that's so much of what the uh, Ukraine aid is about, too. You know, Zelensky came to D.C. just on Capitol Hill two days ago. He met with Biden. But who else did he meet with? The heads of North Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon, all the big arms manufacturers. That's his main constituency for support in a country that's tired of shoveling billions of dollars into a proxy war that Ukraine has effectively lost, where they're bringing, like, old men and women to the front lines to die for what? But that war is it's just a way of washing money through a conflict back into the arms of these contractors who are responsible for like the flourishing economy of Washington, D.C., where you know, so many people there are contractors. So that's, that's, that's a huge problem, um, but it's something that needs to be taken on directly. Congress, I mean, is pathetic and bought off, but and, and they're willing to they're willing to accept that the State Department of Tony Blinken authorized a shipment of 16,000 tank shells to Israel without congressional approval. They fast track it. They're providing no transparency on these weapons. So the least we can do is demand more transparency, force Congress to at least demand some authority, make them vote on it. It's like how, you know, they should have voted on uh, Medicare for all, but the squad didn't want to make that a negotiating point, at least force them to vote on genocide. Um, and then on the, on, the, on, the, on the free speech attacks and, and, and what uh, Sabrina was saying about what's happening at Harvard, Penn, my alma mater, where, uh, as Curtis Mayfield put it, I met educated fools from uneducated schools. Um, and uh, what is it, Yale? This is all a, a, a concerted campaign that's being organized by the Israel lobby. Everyone involved in it is an Israel lobbyist. And if you look at the timeline, and we're going to have a piece by Wyatt Reed up tomorrow at the Gray Zone that explains how this all unfolded. It started in Congress where they began to define statements of anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism. And there's now a new resolution by Tom Cotton to declare from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free as hate speech. All the fake free speech warriors are supporting the greatest attack on the First Amendment in history, or, well, since probably HUAC. Um, and they use that as leverage to question these college presidents on those phrases with the assumption that they're calls for the genocide of Jews. There are no calls for the genocide of Jews on any college campus. 
And then they've got this lawsuit at UPenn. Okay, I went to Penn. We proudly called it Jew Penn because there were so many Jewish kids there because the other Ivy League schools back in the day had quotas on how many Jews could go to, to school because they were afraid that we were just going to, you know, excel. It was supposed to be, you know, Harvard was supposed to be, you know, Brahmin Wasp City, and they didn't want us, we were scoring really well on the tests and everything. So UPenn didn't have quotas, so it had a large number of Jewish students. When I went there in the 90s, Jewish students thrived there, like the five towns of Long, I felt like I was living in the five towns of Long Island when I was there. Jewish students felt no threat, and it's the same today. The problem for them is that it's a more diverse student population, where South Asians, uh, Arabs, people who are from countries where they don't just get brainwashed on Israel are coming in because they're scoring very well and performing very well um, and do you know they're they're on their way to being engineers and so on and they are leading activism that didn't exist during the 1990s when I was there so how do they stop it just define it all as hate speech define it all as genocide and uh, get campus presidents fired if they will not crack down because the Zionist appeal is not to the people. They don't have people to appeal. They don't have a, a real base to appeal to. It's always an appeal to authority to either assassinate someone they don't like or to assassinate their character, fire them, destroy their careers, dox them. And that's what they're doing with these campus presidents who performed very poorly and have revealed themselves to be extremely mediocre, like our entire liberal intelligentsia that fell for so many propaganda shams. Uh, I wasn't surprised. And so we're stuck with this fake debate over a non-existent wave of anti-Semitism that's being defined according to terms that are cooked up by the Israel lobby. Most of it is based on ADL data, and the ADL is defined Pal rallies like the one you promoted in Saturday as an anti-Semitic incident. So their anti-Semitic incident reports are filled with rallies for, for Palestine solidarity, for an end to the killing of women and children. I could just call and say, you know, somebody said something mean to me and I'm Jewish and they would, they would rack that up as an anti-Semitic incident. We asked them for the raw data and the incident reports and they refused to provide it to us. And then you have the UPenn students lawsuit all the students are actually Israel lobby cadres who are interning for APAC and so on. The law firm is a pro-Israel law firm connected to Donald Trump's Israel and former Israel ambassador David Friedman. And look at what they're alleging. One student from SJP wrote an op-ed uh, declaring that Israel's an apartheid state. That's an anti-Semitic incident, according to them. So we just... I mean, more, we just have to just not accept their terms, not accept the intimidation, not believe them, and just assume that everything they say is either a lie or a confession. Okay, great. Thank you, Joe, for that question, and thank you, Max. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. I'll try to keep uh, it shorter. Maybe we could fold a few questions into one, like, you know, to take two or three at once. Do you once. want to take two or three at once? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so yes, please keep the questions. We, there's so many questions online, but we're going to prioritize questions in the auditorium today. So yes, we'll take two more questions. Uh, do, do you think there should be more pressure on the Arab monarchs to impose an oil embargo to possibly end the violence? And let's take another, let's give Max another question. The school teacher in the Jerusalem area, Mayor Baruchin, um, can you tell us more about him? Do you know where his case is? And about the censorship that um, he says all his colleagues feel, but that he was very proud because his children well, felt good about what he did, that they were proud of him. For doing, can you just say for what, just quickly. He, I mean, I know. He posted on Facebook, and he talked to his students about the plight of Palestinians. I don't know what he posted, so if you can tell us about that. I see his Facebook page. Honestly, I'm afraid to send him a message because I don't know who can monitor that and if that could potentially in, um, I don't know in terms of if he were to receive messages if that could in any way affect him I'll, I'll leave it at that, but if you can clue us into he did say one thing he said Sorry if he was Palestinian and young he'd be treated much worse And I'm wondering how he knows that is that's a common belief in Israel 
how, how he, it's an epistemological thing. What does he know? What do the other Israelis know? What are they afraid to tell? And what are we not being told? They, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll knock those. Yeah, l let's take one more. We'll get you. Regarding the um, current situation in Ukraine, uh, we've seen Vitaly Klitschko recently say that Zelensky is turning it an, into an authoritarian state. Uh, Zelensky's aide has faced more opposition from the U.S. government, you know, within the Republicans. And uh, recently, what is it? They haven't been doing so well during the counteroffensive either. So, and with uh, is the, Israel, the Israel situation currently stretching U.S. resources thinner, uh, what do you think the future of U.S. policy is going to look like regarding aid to Ukraine? Do you think that that's going to die down in favor of Israel or et cetera? Oh, great questions. Um, on the first question about cutting off oil, but well, the Arab monarchs are not going to do this. I mean, the, these are the, the the whole like existence of them is contingent on their direct line to Washington, and they are sort of the the fake Arab countries that were set up to displace the real sources of Arab popular power, which used to reside in Cairo, and we're seeing Sanaa start to rise up uh, after years and years of. Uh, being pummeled by the West via Saudi Arabia. Um, we're starting to see some change, but of course, so the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia are not going to cut off oil, nor is Qatar, which is uh, uh, at the center of negotiations and uses Hamas as a strategic card, but was always participating in Netanyahu's occupation management schemes by transferring a little bit of money and fuel to the government in Gaza to keep it going under siege, um, and then stepping aside when Netanyahu's forces would quote unquote mow the lawn. The real question would be, and it was this was a question put to Samuel Arian, who spoke here, uh, who's in Istanbul, Turkey, and has a very good sense of what's going on there with the leadership in Turkey. I mean, you have guys like lining up to volunteer to fight in Gaza who are whipped up. Uh, by the images they're seeing of horrible atrocities, and also by Erdogan's own words. Erdogan is basically calling, like, temp like taunting Israel and, uh, as, a, as a weak army that Turkey could defeat. But he will not cut off oil or gas. He won't put his money where his mouth is. The, the gas to Israel is coming through Azerbaijan, and he could cut that off tomorrow. He can't do it because, as Samuel Arian correctly said, there are so many U.S. points of pressure on Turkey that we could bring their economy to, uh, to a state of ruin very quickly, um, as well as um, activate all of our Kurdish proxies there. There was a horrible bombing in Taksim Square last year in Istanbul, the main tourist area, by a Kurdish militant. And what did the... Uh, the U.S. Uh, issued an apology or, or a statement of um, sorrow through its embassy, and the Turkish interior minister rejected the U.S. statement of sorrow and blamed the U.S. directly for that because Turkey was getting a little too uppity within NATO. It's in, it's in NATO, so we can control that. So there's, I don't see anything happening as far as like the kind of oil embargo we saw in the early 70s, which would really lead to a ceasefire pretty quickly, especially with Biden going for re-election. Um, Meyer Bruchen was a school teacher who has been jailed or is being prosecuted for a statement he made on Facebook for Israelis and the Israeli real left, the anti-Zionist left in Israel, which no numbers like less than a thousand active participants. Uh, they're, they know that they can be jailed and prosecuted for political speech now under these current conditions. And many of them that I speak to are afraid to really go outside. Uh, there was a small anti-war rally in Tel Aviv, uh, but they're, they're under intense surveillance. And you can see that he um, was jailed and um, Israel's occupying the internet within its own realm. So any Palestinian will be jailed uh, or in even publicly humiliated. They will be interrogated in front of an Israeli flag, and then that will be broadcast on Israeli media if they make a statement uh, seen as pro-Hamas on Facebook. Uh, this is just happening again and again and again. Um, and as we see with Rifat al he may have been assassinated for his Twitter postings. So, yes, they're occupying any space they possibly can. 
Israel is a, a totalitarian military dictatorship, uh, which poses as a democracy for its Jewish population. And that mask has been lifted, just as the mask in Ukraine of Ukraine fighting to save democracy is finally being lifted with this statement by Vitaly Klitschko, who was one of the three major coup officials that came in with the U.S.-backed Maidan coup in 2014, famous professional boxer. He's the mayor of Kiev. He's involved in this anti-democratic system they have there, where anyone who is seen as pro-Russian, ethnically Russian, opposing the war effort in the East between 2014 and 2022 uh, was jailed. He was giving over names and warning people not to say anything, critical of the Maidan regime. So, and now he's criticizing Zelensky for being so deeply authoritarian. And it's not, re it's, it's the people behind Zelensky. They have banned every opposition party in Ukraine. 13 opposition parties completely banned the party of regions of Viktor Medvedchuk, which was the Zelensky's main rival in the last presidential election. All of its leadership that's still there has been rounded up, tortured by Ukraine's SBU. Some of them have been disappeared. Medvedchuk himself was taken in and beaten. Um, I, and, 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 then the, and then this is our model democracy that we're supposedly fighting for? Well, Taiwan, it's, d Taiwan's another thing to look at. I mean, they're still kind of having like an election there. But let's look at, a, let's look at Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel as three of what uh, three unsinkable aircraft carriers, that's how the US sees them, as strategic bastions for meeting out violence against the uh, regional independent states that threaten the US with a multi the rise of a multipolar world order, keeping them weak, forcing them to spend more on their defense, containment strategy 101. And that's what the US sees for the future of Ukraine. It's a future that Zelensky himself has described as a big Israel, sort of uh, Israel in Eastern Europe. And uh, Daniel Shapiro, who is the former US ambassador to Israel under Obama, who then stayed in Israel because he's so much more connected to that country than the US apparently, and began consulting for its notorious NSO group, which produces the Pegasus spyware. And he produced a paper for the Atlantic Council on how Ukraine could become a big Israel. And Daniel Shapiro is also, according to a recent Politico piece, now consulting on the post-war plan for Gaza after the genocide is completed. Um, so we know what that's about. So even though Ukraine has lost the war, they're not going to recover that one third of their territory in the east. The counteroffensive was a complete failure. Everyone is the Washington Post, Economist, New York Times all have cover stories saying what we at the gray zone were saying last year, which was it wasn't going to go down the way they wanted it to. There wasn't going to be a beach party in Crimea. Stop wasting our money. Stop killing Ukrainian men, shoveling them into a slaughterhouse and just negotiate. But what the U.S. will want there is maybe a rump state that will still remain this anti-Russian antagonist in the region, this mad dog in the region like Israel. Um, but they don't have the same, I think the problem is for Ukraine is they just don't have the same support in Congress that Israel maintains. They don't have the same kind of emotional, visceral, uh, and moral support that Israel maintains from both parties. Um, so at some point, they may have to go back to ne the neutrality that would have given them back 500,000 of their sons if they had just stayed that way. Yeah, we had one more, can we? We, we have time for like two more? Yeah, I think we have time for like one more round of questions. So, yes. Um, okay. Did you have a question? Um, okay. Um, a growing number of Americans are aware that the war in Gaza and the West Bank is being fought on two fronts. The physical front with the land, air, sea bombings and killing, killings at close range and from the sky and the starvation and the disease by the fourth most powerful a well-funded army in the world. And then that second war, the electronic one, the media, especially social media, and influencing in the algorithms 
and the you know redirecting um, redirecting people's posts and turning down views, canceling accounts, firing tech people. So I guess um, the question is is perhaps Israel losing the physical war since even though the Palestinians are the big losers, but are they kind of losing the physical war because most of the world is horrified by the violence and want a permanent ceasefire with the UN count and all of that. But is Israel winning a very important control of information war like the Zuckerberg in charge of Insta and you know, Facebook and, and his ties to the Pentagon and Israel? Great question. Yeah, is it winning the, the fear and the misinformation? Great question. Max, let me give you two more. Okay, I'm going to give you one. And then you well, we, this hand was up, up in the prior round right here in the front. Okay. And, all right, so let's go to Ed. Uh, two, two things. Uh, one is um, you talk about deaths that happened in Gaza, but you never talk about uh, the number of injuries. You might, uh, that's yeah. su substantially higher. Uh, the one other point I want to bring up is in Massachusetts we have the majority whip who, who is uh, Kathleen Clark. Her job is to whip up um, a consensus in the Democratic Party of the neoliberals, the conservatives, and the, and the squad so that they all are on the same page. Uh, I looked up uh, in Open Secrets uh, her major, her, her top donor is, I can tell you the name of it, it's uh, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and APAC. Okay. I think so I've heard of that uh, before. Th this is the pressure that not only um, th that she is under, but she now spreads it to the rest of the party. Just ma make a comment about it. And one more. Well, thanks for being here. I watch all of your shows. Um, my question is. Uh, how is Israel able to um, target these individuals in Gaza? Is it through their cell phones, or I was just curious? Excellent questions. I mean, that was quick. Uh, do you want, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what role Iran is playing in this crisis, and what can it do more? Okay, the first question was on, uh, you know, the, the information war and the physical war. And I, I, this is something I wanted to say in my talk, but I wanted to get to questions, is that there is a military battle taking place all across the Gaza Strip. And Israel is not achieving its military objectives, and it's been two months. They have won the war on Palestinian babies and civilians and hospitals, which can't defend themselves. They have not succeeded on any of their military objectives vis-a-vis -vis Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and the other armed factions. Um, first of all, they said that they would rescue the hostages through their military, and they completely failed. And they've only had one operation where they identified one soldier. They had a commando raid. The commandos were defeated solidly. Two were killed. Communications gear was captured by Al-Qassam militants, or I would call them the Palestinian Defense Forces in Gaza right now. And uh, then they had to rely on heavy fire support, as they always do, in order to extricate the rest of their forces. And you have uh, helicopters going in and out of Gaza now, northern Gaza, taking Israeli soldiers to hospitals, which are so full, according to Yediot Aronot, a major Israeli mainstream paper, that they've started filling up civilian hospitals with injured Israeli soldiers. Two, three days ago, a uh, force of elite Israeli soldiers was ambushed in Shujaia, east of Gaza City. They lost 10 officers and non-commissioned officers. They lost the regiment commander, Tomer Greenberg, who's a lieutenant colonel. This was the Golani Brigade that had been terrorizing Gaza City that blew up Gaza's parliament and that was seen inside Gaza's schools. And they have lost the core of their unit. And that happened a day after Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, said that Hamas had uh, fallen apart and that its military was falling apart. Just, and you know, you just look, I mean, just, it's arbitrary, but take a look at the videos that Al-Qassam and 
um, Sayar al-Quds, the armed wing of Islamic Jihad, are putting out. They're hitting Israeli military vehicles day after day with these Yassin 105 rocket-propelled tandem grenades uh, that were specifically made to uh, uh, disable Merkava tanks. And I was skeptical at first that they were succeeding. They are taking out a lot of armor, a lot of armor. And a lot of soldiers are being wounded. Haaretz said, we've never seen it. No, Ynet said, we've never seen anything like this before with all of these injuries. Um, so how long can this continue to go on in a very close-knit society where everyone kind of knows each other and with through the military, where they're very casualty averse, where people have dual citizenship and can just go to Germany, where they want to come back to their girlfriends and go to their raves? versus people who have nowhere to go, who have no choice but to stand their ground. How long can it go on? And then what happens if Hezbollah joins the fight? That I don't call them an Iranian proxy. That's false. They are an Iranian ally, like Hamas, which is not Shia, which is Sunni. Um, and Iran does support resistance throughout the region. Yah region. Yahya Senwar said, and I'll come back to your thing on information war. Yahya Senwar, the prime minister, said, uh, what did the Arab states give us? They give us nothing. They, Iran at least gave us some missiles to fight back with, but the main thing they gave them, Iran gave them, was the know-how, how to make them, how to use them. Um, they've trained them in special forces tactics. And then you have Hezbollah, which is armed more directly. They have a more of an ideological relationship with Iran through the Shia faith and their kind of tradition of resisting Israel and Lebanon. And uh, they had, they gained offensive capacity in through their experience in Syria, something they've never had before. Um, so they pose a major military threat to Israel. They also have anti-ship missiles, uh, which they have showcased uh, as a message to the U.S. fleet in the eastern Mediterranean. They're called Noor anti-ship missiles. They took out an Israeli cruiser-class ship in 2006. That's one of what they, they call their surprises. The surprises are the unknown weapons we don't know they have. Um, Israel's constantly hitting Syria now because it's afraid of all the weapons that are being taken through Syria, uh, probably orchestrated or uh, with the help of the IRGC um, to the Hezbollah forces in South Lebanon. And we can see so much of this as a consequence of killing Major General Qasem Soleimani. Um, just the rage that people feel in the region for that and the desire to get back at the who they see as the architect of that killing, Netanyahu and his proxy in the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo. These are the, these are the forces, including Al-Qassam, these are the forces that Soleimani had trained and strengthened over the years. And so uh, let's not forget about that. Iran didn't know about October 7th. Hezbollah didn't know about October 7th. That's one of the first things that Hassan Nasrallah said in his first speech addressing this, is we were caught by surprise. And so they were not able to prepare. They haven't made, they haven't made a, a, strict, a, a decision on whether to go in. Lebanon is suffering a lot now from economic sanctions, from just a general condition of the global economy, from the explosion at the Beirut port. It's gonna be, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation for Hezbollah to navigate within because they're also very influential within internal domestic politics. And Iran, too, is just beginning to recover from U.S. sanctions. And so they would not want to risk a war where Tehran could be hit, where they would have to face the U.S. directly. Uh, so they're being cautious. But I also know that they would not want to, th they, they basically have had a treaty or a, so a sort of agreement with Hamas not to let Gaza fall. Um, and what's happening right now in the north is they're, uh, they're preoccupying a large portion of the Israeli military and trying to keep them there so they can't concentrate on Gaza. And that's significant. On the information war, I mean, whatever, the propaganda war, I, we're winning uh, because the truth and morality is on our side, uh, but we don't live in a democracy. And all of you here, probably most of you come from the left, and the Democratic Party counts on you in November to come around and vote for it because you don't want the big bad orange Hitler to come back and uh, destroy democracy on day one. And uh, you're just supposed to fall for that. And I think we need to just finally, we need to say no. 
We need to really organize a major protest vote and remember in November, assuming this is genocide is over by then, remember in November, um, send a clear message um, and use our strength in alternative media and getting out we, we can get we can get people out to rallies and to vote um, and one viable person I would say is Jill Stein uh, she's out, she's standing with protesters at ports and at weapons factories uh, against this assault on Gaza and she has ballot access in at least 40 states unlike Cornell West who I don't know what he did with his campaign but he doesn't I don't think he has ballot access um, so it's important to be able to make a a, a concentrated vote so that they can say, the pundits will say, Biden made a huge mistake by bear hugging Netanyahu as he committed genocide. He signed away his political career and there is now a powerful block within America against this kind of policy that is countering APAC. Because I think we're winning in, we're, we're winning in getting our message out, but we don't have anywhere for it to go institutionally. Um, and there was the question about, yeah, I mean, that's what, your question. Did I get to it? Yes, Say it again. Oh, Repeat I, it. I, I assume you were able to uh, target Palestinians yeah. with the, the cell phone targeting. Yeah, I mean, uh, the s cell phones are a, one way of getting a target within sort of a 50 to 100 meter radius. So do you remember the bombing of the first major bombing of the Jabalia refugee camp when some 300 people were killed in this northern refugee camp? And then Israel came out and said, uh, well, we got our target. And then it was some random Hamas commander that no one had ever heard of. I was thinking like, yeah, they're, they're going for like some legendary Hamas commander like Mohammed Daif, who's actually like the legendary head of the Al Qassam brigades, that it would have really struck a psychological blow and that they were going to kill hundreds of people for that. But no, it was for some random guy. I don't even know if he died. They had detected his cell phone signal there, obviously, and they decided to drop several 2,000 pound GBU bombs and slaughtered so many families. And the US was like, oh, well, we're deeply concerned about this and uh, we're just gonna move on. So that's one way they do it. Another way they do it is they have the entire population registry of the Gaza Strip and they know uh, who belongs to Hamas. So it's like, who belongs to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Where are they sleeping? Okay, well, we need targets. Let's go bomb their house. I actually saw a presentation. This was so wild. There was a presentation obviously paid for at the former museum in Washington. It was like a museum to like the mainstream corporate media. And I'm so glad it's gone now. Um, it, it was like, uh, they had Avital Leibovich, who was a former Israeli army spokeswoman there, to talk about uh, the propaganda war around Gaza. And she presented video on a TV, like wherever the one was. Um, and she said, uh, this is a, a Hamas family going into the house and here is us bombing them. And, uh, you know, I'm like, you're basically bragging at a museum in D.C. about killing what you call a Hamas family. And I'm just supposed to accept that as normal. And, and I mean, do you know how detached from reality that is? And I actually stood up and started heckling her and I'm like, this is disgusting. You're saying the whole family deserves to die because they're a quote unquote Hamas family, but that's how the military thinks of it. They're not targeting people who are necessarily militants. It's people who might belong to the social services wing of Hamas and they live with 30 people. So the whole family goes down. Um, and then the other way is through informants. Uh, the Gaza informant network is deep. It's honeycombed with snitches. And snitches are people who've been turned in Israeli prisons or in order to get work permits to go out of Gaza. Um, and you know, when you go out through the Erez crossing, there's a huge, uh, graffiti, uh, not huge, but there's a graffiti mural that warns you against becoming an informant. And it's telling you don't do it because that's one of the first things they're gonna try to do on the other side is promise you some benefit if you inform and say, who's the Hamas guy in your neighborhood and where are they? And then once they take all that information, then when the war begins, they just push the button, kill him, kill him. And as I said, they have an AI gener target generation uh, mechanism. So it just all flows into their systems and that's what the israeli military is we really see what it is it's like the fakest army ever they're not fighting well face to face they always have to be extracted from face to face confrontations with heavy artillery fire and shelling to get out 
They're basically an army of button pushers who are sitting in air-conditioned offices. Uh, and TikTok freaks who are posting like video proudly of themselves looting and destroying gift shops in Gaza and committing all kinds of acts of vandalism, stealing people's bikes, like a meathead army of thugs who are proud of that. So uh, great question. Uh, I hope I answered, did I answer everything or was there any more? Yeah. The injuries, yeah. Well, I mean, according to the most conservative estimate, I think it's like 50,000 now. And these are serious injuries. I don't know if any of you have been to Gaza, but even before 20, before this assault, I would just see people, so many injured people in the street, in wheelchairs, missing legs. Um, and the most common way to die in Gaza is just your house collapses on you. Um, and now people are dying of disease and exposure, and children are starving to death. Uh, and we're not seeing any, any we are the world. Where are the celebrities, you know? Where's, uh, where's Taylor Swift, the woman of the year, person of the year? Th 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 there's, there's nothing. I actually know an A-list celebrity. Uh, I'm not going to name them, obviously. I don't want to embarrass anyone. But an A-list celebrity who read my books, I know that they read them. And I said, you know about Palestine. You know what's happening there. Couldn't you call for a ceasefire? Uh, you have a lot more cachet than I do. You're kind of like royalty. And uh, yeah, I don't think I'm ever going to be hearing from this person again. So it's again, it's up to us to pick up the marker and throw it at the architects of this genocide in any way we can. And that's what you all are here for. And uh, you know, I really appreciate what, what, every, what you guys are doing. Um, and I look forward to coming back in better times after a ceasefire. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Max. Thanks for coming from DC. Thank you again, everyone, so much. A uh, special thank you to Charlie Welch and Jose and uh, Sabi Sabs and Dean Stevens. And uh, on that note, I'm going to say to everyone.